So, Steve, I see you have your breakfast of champions there with you. Janet McDermott planned to stop by her office only briefly on the morning of October 15, 1985. Have a nice day, Steve. She had a number of business appointments around Salt Lake City that day. Moments later, an explosion rocked the building, killing her colleague who worked next door. Science uncovered a tale of forgery, fraud, and murder. The explosion occurred on the sixth floor of the historic Judge Building in downtown Salt Lake City. Killed in the blast was 31-year-old Steve Christensen, a financial consultant who left behind his wife, Terry, and a young family. He was lying in the doorway of his office, and uh, he was lying on his right side, burn marks on his face, uh, smoke marks, and blood. The explosion ripped the door off its hinges, and the location of the debris told investigators that the blast occurred directly in front of Steve Christensen's office door. You could tell the precise location where the bomb exploded. Match that with the autopsy, and we could tell where the bomb was when it exploded because of its shearing power, breaking bones, going through skin, things of that nature. Small pieces of batteries and fragments of pipe were found in the hallway as well. Many of the parts had the name Tandy imprinted, a brand sold exclusively in Radio Shack electronic stores. All of the fragments were collected and pieced back together, revealing that the explosion was caused by a pipe bomb. This is a replica of the type which was used. But who wanted to kill Steve Christensen, and why? Christensen had recently resigned his job as Vice President of Consolidated Financial Services, or CFS, a real estate investment company which was undergoing serious financial difficulties. Many clients had lost large sums of money, and some were alleging fraud. In the debris, police discovered a piece of brown wrapping paper with Christensen's first name written in thick black marker. Bruce Passy had a jewelry business a few floors below Steve Christensen's office. He told police he noticed something unusual in the elevator that morning. I told them that I saw a box this morning that had the name Steve Christensen, and that my father and I went up an elevator with the gentleman holding this box. Janet McDermott recalled seeing the package in the hallway directly in front of Steve Christensen's office door. A motion-sensitive mercury switch was found in the debris, an indication that the bomb was activated by tilting the package. Motion-sensitive bombs are almost always delivered by the bombers themselves, so they can be delivered without going off. Bruce Passy described the delivery man as a white male about five feet eight inches tall with medium brown hair. Once he came in, I mean, he was wearing a high school letter jacket without the letter on it, but it had uh, the colors of a letter jacket. I was just very concerned for the business community and that other people might be involved on a revenge type situation, uh, whether it be for investments or uh, gone bad or something similar to that. And I was worried who would be the next victim. That worry became reality just two hours later. Two hours after the bombing which killed Steve Christensen, there was another explosion across town. This time, the victim was 50-year-old Kathy Sheets. Her husband, Gary, was the former business partner of Steve Christensen. It was real devastating to have your mother killed on your front doorstep. You feel that you're safe in your home and that it's okay, and to have something like that happen really shattered your faith that things are okay. Once again, the fragments recovered at the scene were consistent with a pipe bomb. Police found scraps of brown paper near the blast with the name of the victim's husband, Gary Sheets. 
the time I got to the second scene, I already knew what I was looking for, if there were going to be similarities. Within 25 minutes, I had found the similarities. Within uh, five hours, I found a component. That component was a very small piece of a mercury switch. A mercury switch was found at the Christensen bomb site as well. A mercury switch is a glass ball filled with mercury, a liquid metal. When the mercury is tilted, it completes the electrical circuit, triggering the explosion. We had a lot of similarities, and they would include the cardboard container, the types of tape, more than one type, the size of the pipe, that which includes the diameter and the length, the explosive inside, the type of explosives inside. Gunpowder from both bomb sites were sent to the Federal Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Lab for analysis. They store samples of every known gunpowder manufactured. The particles of gunpowder from the pipe bombs were placed on a profile projector, which measures the size and shape of the granules. When this information was entered into a computer database, the gunpowder was identified as Hercules Bullseye brand. The same type was used in both bombs. Since Radio Shack batteries and electrical components were found at both bomb sites, detectives checked all of the Radio Shack stores in the Salt Lake City area. Records showed that an individual by the name of Mike Hansen had recently purchased the same components from this Radio Shack store in Holiday, Utah. The store had an address for Mike Hansen, but it was a vacant lot, and detectives suspected that the name was an alias. The only individual who reported seeing anything suspicious at the Sheets home was a 13-year-old neighbor, Aaron Teplick. He told police he saw a tan Toyota minivan turn into the Sheets driveway around midnight, the night before the bombing. He said the van drove out of the Sheets driveway a few minutes later, but the boy could offer no description of the driver. I think we have a serial bomber out there. What was entering into my mind was, how soon are we gonna have another bombing? It was a very short wait. While investigators were sifting through the rubble of the bombings which killed Steve Christensen and Kathy Sheets, there was a third explosion the very next day. This time, it happened in a parked car in downtown Salt Lake City. The victim was 30-year-old Mark Hoffman, a rare documents dealer. Unlike the other two victims, Hoffman survived the blast. Hoffman's injuries were severe, the explosion blew off the tips of two fingers. A portion of his right kneecap was missing, and a piece of metal was embedded in his knee. Mark Hoffman said that he pulled open the door, and the package fell from the seat of the car onto the floorboard of the car, at which time it exploded and he was injured. Mark Hoffman had no connection with the CFS Corporation. He was a well-known and respected rare documents dealer who specialized in early Mormon currency and documents. But Mark Hoffman and Steve Christensen knew one another. Christensen was a collector of rare books and documents and had purchased some items from Hoffman over the years. One thing detectives knew, the bombs which killed Steve Christensen, Kathy Sheets, and seriously injured Mark Hoffman were all made by the same individual. They also knew that evidence inside Mark Hoffman's car was inconsistent with what he told police. Hoffman said someone placed a package on the seat of his car, and when he opened the car door, the package fell onto the floor and exploded. But when a pipe bomb explodes, the end caps blow out in a straight line. One of the end caps blew a hole through the side door on the passenger side. The other end cap was found in Mark Hoffman's knee. This important detail told investigators that the bomb did not explode on the floor of the car, as Hoffman indicated. It didn't line up with the exploding bomb. And we can't change that because of the holes in the vehicle. That's a true. 
It's now taking the injured pieces of the individual, putting them so they come in contact with the bomb. The injury to Hoffman's knee indicated that his right knee was on the driver's seat at the time of the explosion. And the injuries to Hoffman's fingers indicated that he had been touching the bomb when it exploded. So now we have an injured hand, an injured leg, and I know the attitude the pipe bomb was in. I also know that he has uninjured body parts. The other leg is in very good shape. There's not even any burn damage. So I have part of him outside the car, part of him inside the car. The evidence revealed that the bomb exploded over the center console, in between the two front seats, and not on the floor of the vehicle, as Hoffman indicated. When police searched Mark Hoffman's home, they found a high school letter jacket with the letter missing similar to the one Bruce Passy saw on the delivery man in the elevator on the morning of Steve Christensen's murder. Even more alarming, police discovered that Hoffman owned a tan-colored Toyota minivan, similar to the one the teenage boy saw driving into the Sheets driveway the night before the bombing. Inside Hoffman's van, police discovered a single flake of gunpowder. Tests revealed that it was Hercules bullseye gunpowder, the same type used in making the pipe bombs. We had no idea why Mark Hoffman, if he were the perpetrator, would kill a close associate and friend of his, Steve Christensen. And for all we knew, he didn't even know Kathleen Sheets. Hoffman told police that he was a victim and even took a lie detector test to prove his innocence. We've had him take a polygraph and he passed with flying colors not even close. He passed with a high number saying that he was not deceptive and that he did not do the bombings. Despite the polygraph results, investigators were suspicious of Mark Hoffman since the scientific evidence was inconsistent with his description of the bombing. On the day of Steve Christensen's murder, Mark Hoffman was scheduled to meet with Mormon church officials to discuss some early Mormon documents he was selling known as the McClellan Collection. Steve Christensen was active in the Mormon Church and was asked to attend that meeting in order to certify that the documents were authentic. As I was inquiring about uh, who examined the documents, it was my feeling it had never been examined forensically. George Throckmorton was asked to do just that to use scientific forensic methods to find out whether some of the world's leading experts had been fooled. Despite the fact that Mark Hoffman passed a lie detector test, bomb experts from the Federal Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms were convinced that Mark Hoffman was inside his automobile, possibly arming the bomb when it accidentally exploded. The scientific evidence supported their theory, but missing was a motive. How you prove Mark Hoffman was a murderer is you first proved that he was a con man, that his whole life was based upon fraud. George Throckmorton is a forensic document examiner who was asked to examine the rare documents Mark Hoffman had sold over the years. He compared them to other rare documents the Mormon Church had in its vault from the same time period which Hoffman had nothing to do with. Under ultraviolet light, many of the documents Hoffman sold turned blue. This was not the case with the documents the Mormon Church obtained from other sources. Under a microscope, Throckmorton noticed that the ink on Hoffman's documents ran in one direction. In the other documents, the ink was absorbed by the paper uniformly, spreading in all directions. And Throckmorton discovered microscopic cracks in the ink on the documents Hoffman uncovered. Throckmorton calls it alligatoring, and there was none of this in any of the other documents. At this point, it made us say something's wrong, but we don't know what. Why are Hoffman's documents different than the other documents? 
When Mark Hoffman's home was searched following the bombings, police discovered a book which contained a recipe for iron galatanic ink, an ink that was common in the 1800s. Throckmorton made a batch of that ink and wrote with it on some paper. He then applied an ammonia solution which is known to age paper. The test document displayed the same blue haze under ultraviolet light. And when it was hung to dry, the ink ran in one direction and exhibited the same alligatoring condition as the Hoffman documents. Finally, Throckmorton turned his attention to the oath of a freeman, believed to be the oldest printed document in the United States. It was a document Mark Hoffman said he purchased in a used bookstore and was valued at over $1 million. It had been authenticated by both the Library of Congress and the FBI. When Throckmorton looked at it closely, he found a curious anomaly. There was a tiny flaw in the letter M. That microscopic flaw was not caused by old age, was not caused by a printing problem. It was caused through the photographic process. Therefore, that document had to go through that photographic process. The flaw looked like emulsion on a photographic negative. This modern printing method did not exist in 1638 when the oath of a freeman was allegedly written. Therefore, it had to be counterfeit. Inside Hoffman's home, police discovered a receipt from a printing company in Utah. It was for a printing plate for the oath of a freeman document. The printing company thought the plate was used to print facsimiles. In fact, it was. Hoffman took the plate, added the old ink recipe and a piece of old paper to create the forgery, and offered it for sale as an original. On the receipt was the name Mike Hansen, but it included Mark Hoffman's telephone number. It was the same name used at the Radio Shack store to purchase the bomb components. Throckmorton's forensic document examination proved that Hoffman was a fraud and a forger. Prosecutors believe that Steve Christensen was on to Mark Hoffman and was about to expose him as a liar and possibly a fraud. Hoffman sensed this and decided to murder Steve Christensen with a pipe bomb. But Hoffman wanted Christensen's murder to appear to be business-related, so he delivered a diversionary bomb to Christensen's former business partner, Gary Sheets. The boy living across the street saw a van similar to Hoffman's pull into the Sheets' driveway around midnight. Hoffman placed the pipe bomb package on the front walkway to the Sheets' home. The next morning, Hoffman delivered the primary bomb to Steve Christensen's office building. It was packed with more than a hundred masonry nails, leaving no doubt that its intent was to kill, not injure. And I have to, uh, the jewelry store owner hands. identified Brace Mark Hoffman as the man wearing the letter jacket in the elevator. He was carrying a package addressed to Steve Christensen. Hoffman left the package outside Christensen's office door. It was armed with a motion-sensitive mercury switch set to explode when tilted at a 45-degree angle. Bye. Have a good day, Steve. Steve Christensen picked up the package when he arrived for work. Two hours later, Kathy Sheets noticed the package left outside her home, addressed to her husband, Gary. Mark Hoffman was arrested and charged with two counts of murder and for theft by deception for selling forged documents. 
Hoffman pleaded guilty to second-degree murder and was convicted. A parole board recommended that he spend the rest of his life in prison. Ironically, many of Hoffman's forgeries are still on the market. Every single document that I looked at had been forged or manipulated in some way to make it valuable. And I looked at over 600 of his documents. Every single one of them was forged. He never found a single genuine document ever. And the deception turned a mild-mannered documents dealer into a killer. I think Mark is probably the most evil of uh, people that I've worked with. Serial bombers, by and large, are much more evil. They don't want to just hurt you. They want to continue to hurt many people. And how common is it for a bomber to blow himself up when handling one of his own bombs. Not common enough. <laughs>